modern man is taught to believe that he has a soul, a single soul, and his ideas of that one soul are vague indeed. The ancient Egyptian thought himself more richly endowed. He believed that he had five souls, and each of those five souls he professed to understand. There was the Ka, the part of him which required food and drink, not only in life, but during all the long ages in the tomb. There was the Bai, the soul which hovered about the tomb in the form of a bird, and which, on some far distant day, would return to the body to bring it back to life. There was the Ron, or the name, the Kibet, or the shadow, and the Kat, or the corpse. To care for these five souls all his life long gave the Egyptian trouble enough. To provide for them during the long sleep in the tomb was the one great purpose of his life. He feared that his Ka might suffer hunger and thirst, and there be none to bring relief, or that some day the Bai might return to find the body destroyed, and the homeless soul would wander restlessly about through all of the ages to come. It is not strange, then, that the first duty of the Egyptian was to provide for his souls. The exceedingly dry climate of the Nile Valley favored him. His body, if left exposed, withered away until only the skin and the bones were left, and if not molested, it would so remain indefinitely. To preserve the body in a more natural state by artificial means demanded all the skill of the scientists and gave employment to an army of people. Sometimes the shrinking skin was stuffed with sawdust or with sand. Sometimes the body was preserved in a solution of salt. Or if there were wealth sufficient to defray the cost, the visceral parts were carefully removed and preserving herbs and spices were inserted in their place. So the mummies were formed, and each mummy, with food and drink for the Ka, or with wealth to obtain it, was hidden away in a strong or secret place to await the return of the Bai. In the very early days, when life was simple and grave robbers few, the Egyptian was content with a simple grave. A hole was dug in the sand, the body was placed within a sitting position, a dish of food and a pot of grain were at its side. Poles and brush were laid over the hole, and sand was heaped above. Thus the first pyramid, a little pyramid of sand, was formed. Some, desiring a better tomb for their dead, lined the hole in the sand with boards. Others, wishing to have access to the body, that they might bring it fresh supplies of food and drink, built a passageway down through the sand to a door in the side of the tomb. With the years the wealth of the people increased, the tombs kept pace, and the pyramids of sand rose higher. Sometimes, to hold the heap of sand in place, a retaining wall of bricks was built about it. In time the wall rose to cover the sand, and then the pyramid was all of bricks. Later it was of stone. Centuries passed, life became complicated. The size and the magnificence of the tombs grew with the increasing wealth, rare treasures were buried with the dead, and the grave robber flourished. Each king sought to erect a tomb more magnificent and more secure than any before him, where his mummy and his ka, satisfied with an abundance of provisions, might await in perfect security the far distant day when the Bai should return. So the rocky cliffs bordering the valley and the valley too, abounded with myriads of wonderful tombs. Three dynasties of kings had ruled Egypt and passed away. The fourth came with Khufu, or Cheops, as some call him. The Egyptians spelled his name HWFW. Just when Khufu lived, scholars are uncertain, for it is difficult to determine with accuracy the dates of early Egyptian history. Some say that he ruled from 3969 to 3908 BC, a reign of 60 years. Others believe that he was not born till a thousand years later, or 2900 BC, and that he was king for but 23 years. However, we may be sure that he lived fully 5000 years ago. He was born in Middle Egypt, 
in a town later called Khufu's Nurse. How or why he became the king of Egypt, history has not told us. We know little of his reign. His name appears in the religious literature of a later period, and he was the hero of a popular Egyptian story. Upon a sculptured granite block in the temple at Bubastis, he is represented as slaying his enemy, and upon the rocks at the mines in Sinai are two of his inscriptions. In the temple at Abydos, however, was found a beautiful small ivory figure, a quarter of an inch in length, carved with his portrait. It shows a thin face with an expression of unusual strength. His one great monument is his tomb, the Pyramid at Giza, the first of the seven wonders of the world. Scarcely had Khufu come to the throne when he began the construction of his tomb which should surpass all others in size and costliness. It should be strong enough to defy the most skillful grave robber, too lasting even for time to destroy. For its site he selected the rocky cliff to the west of the Nile, 100 feet above the valley, toward the setting of the sun where it was believed that the spirits of the dead entered the underworld. Preparations for its construction were carefully made. No expense was spared. The resources of the country had long been taxed to support the temples and an army of priests. But religion rested lightly on King Khufu, and perhaps upon his people too. Why should the best fruits of the land be given to the gods whom the king knew to be false? Why should tens of thousands of strong men call themselves priests and live in luxurious idleness? So one of the first acts of King Khufu was to close the temples throughout all Egypt. The offerings to the gods ceased. The throngs of priests and temple attendants joined the ranks of the workers. The herds of cattle and the flocks of fowls, no longer offered daily to delight the gods or to feed the priests, were food for the workmen. It is said that there were 300,000 strong men in Egypt, and that every man, as if he were a slave, was forced to labor for the king. The workmen were divided into three relays of 100,000 men each, and each relay was compelled to work for three months, while the other men of the other two relays supplied them with food and attended to their usual duties. Their only recompense was their food and clothing, and that was scanty enough. Taskmasters, with whips in hand, stood by to urge them on. Thus were the workmen obtained, but even with forced labor, the cost of the construction of the pyramid was enormous. It has been estimated that even with modern machinery, a thousand men would be required to labor for a hundred years if they would duplicate the pyramid. Just what the cost to Khufu was, we may never know. Herodotus writes that in his day, an inscription engraved in hieroglyphic characters on the base of the pyramid stated that for the radishes and onions and garlic consumed by the laborers, there were expended 1,600 talents of silver, or about one million dollars. However, long before the pyramid was completed, the king found his treasury empty. Everywhere he sought for more funds, but the resources of the country were exhausted. A story relates that, as a last resort, he sent his daughter to the stews with orders to procure him a certain sum, and Hentzen, as his daughter was named, procured it. There is another story that Khufu so grievously oppressed his people that when he died they refused to bury him in his wonderful tomb, that his hated name was never spoken aloud that even after centuries had passed, the people called the great tomb the Pyramid of Felician, because a poor shepherd of that name used to graze his sheep about its base. The material for the construction of the tomb was red granite and limestone. The granite, which was used only for the lining of the walls of the inner chambers, was brought down the Nile from Syene in Upper Egypt, 700 miles away. The quarrymen worked in the ancient fashion, splitting the stone with wooden wedges and cutting them into the desired shape with copper saws fed by emery powder. The limestone for the great mass of the pyramid was quarried in the hills of Makatam, 
several miles away on the opposite side of the Nile, and any traveler to Egypt may visit the quarries and see the marks of the adze-like implements with which the workmen of Khufu hewed out the soft stones. A vast army of men was employed in the quarries. Another army, laboring upon the hill at Giza, where the pyramid was to stand, dug into the rock to the depth of eight inches that the foundation stones might remain securely in place. But a core of living rock was left to project upward in the center. A long inclined passage was excavated far down into the solid rock, at the bottom of which a chamber was hollowed out. A third army was engaged for ten years, so Herodotus said, in building a causeway up which the stones were to be transported from the river to the Giza hill. A fragment of it still exists beneath the little modern village of Kafr. These laborious preparations were finally completed and the real work of construction began. At the quarries, the stones were loaded upon sledges and drawn on rollers by men to the river. Barges transported them to the opposite shore, and again upon rollers, long lines of men tugging at the ropes and dragged them to the causeway and up to the place prepared for the pyramid. It is supposed that the construction of some of the Egyptian pyramids began at the time when the king came to the throne, and that each year, as long as he lived, another enclosing layer of stones was added. Thus the pyramid, growing larger and larger, was completed only with his death. But Khufu prophesied for himself a long reign. The size of his pyramid, and the location of the mysterious chambers and passageways within, were determined from the beginning. The pyramid covered 13 acres of ground, and was a perfect square, originally measuring 756 feet on each side. It is a walk of more than half a mile about its base, and so accurate were the measurements that modern engineers with modern instruments can detect an error of but a small fraction of an inch. A wide pavement of limestones surrounded the great structure. The four sides approximately face the cardinal points, the north, south, east, and west. Slowly, layer by layer, the great mass rose, each layer slightly smaller than the one beneath it. It is uncertain just how the stones were raised. Some say that sand was heaped up, forming an inclined plane over which they were dragged, and as the pyramid rose, the inclined plane was built up with it. Pliny says that the inclined plane was of nitre and salt, and that later, when the work was completed, it was melted away with water, or it was of bricks which were torn away. Herodotus, however, tells us that the stones were raised from one stage to another by machines consisting of short planks, perhaps on the lever principle, for the derrick was unknown to the ancients. Thus the pyramid was reared to the height of 481 feet, or 150 feet higher than St. Paul's Cathedral, or nearly twice as high as the Flatiron Building in New York City. Its sides sloped at an angle of about 51 degrees and 50 minutes. 203 of the courses of the masonry still remain, but according to Pliny, the pyramid never came quite to a point, for on the summit was a platform 16 and one half feet in circuit. What, if anything, stood upon the platform, he does not tell us. The present platform is 32 feet and 8 inches square, large enough for a hundred people to stand there comfortably. It is estimated that in the entire pyramid are 2,300,000 blocks of stone, averaging in weight two and a half tons. The average size is four feet and 10 inches in length and two feet and two inches in height. The largest stone visible from the exterior is nine feet long and six and one half feet in height. As we might expect, the stones of the lower courses are larger than those higher up. The mortar used in cementing them was scarcely thicker than a piece of paper, for the joints were fitted together so perfectly that it is impossible to thrust the thinnest knife blade into them. The entire pyramid was once encased with stone polished like glass, and
and to one standing but a short distance away, it must have resembled a single huge stone shining and reflecting the sunlight with dazzling brilliancy. Possibly upon one of the sides was a stairway leading to the summit, for otherwise it would have been impossible to ascend to the platform. Whether or not the casing stones bore hieroglyphic characters, we may never know. Yet Herodotus speaks of one inscription at the base, and Arab writers speak of others. It used to be said that if the casing stone were struck a hard blow, it emitted a peculiar odor, and for that reason the name of stink stone, or swine stone, was given to it. All the ingenuity of the Egyptian architect was employed to conceal the chambers within the pyramid. The entrance at the center of the north side was carefully concealed by the casing stone, and only when the stone was torn away was it revealed. Imagine that you were an ancient Egyptian and would explore the interior of the pyramid. You climb to the 18th course of stones, or 47 feet from the base, to a small opening three and a half feet square leading within. With a guide and a torch you enter. You must bend low for the passage is but five feet high, and step carefully, for it slopes downward at an angle of over 26 degrees. It is a long descent, seemingly interminable, down to the level of the foundation, and then down the shaft through the living rock 317 feet from the entrance. At last, beneath the very center of the pyramid, you enter a large chamber, but even by the dim light of your torch, you may see that the chamber was never completed. King Khufu was not buried there. The chamber was only a part of the plan of the wily old king to deceive the future grave robbers. When the robbers would enter the tomb and find it empty, they would imagine that other robbers had been there before them and abandoned the search, while the mummy of the king would continue to rest securely in a chamber high above. You climb back up the passage to the level of the foundation, where the guide will take you to the entrance of another passage which was once carefully concealed. Still bending low, you follow him up through twenty-five courses of stones, and then along the level to the center of the pyramid. There you reach the queen's chamber, measuring sixteen by eighteen and a half feet, and fourteen feet in height. But the queen was not buried there for this chamber too was constructed to lead the grave robbers astray. You follow your guide from the queen's chamber along the level passage to the point where the incline begins, and opening before you is a great gallery leading still farther upward. You enter, and here you may stand erect, for the gallery is twenty-eight feet high. Up you climb to the height of one hundred and thirty-eight feet above the foundation or to the fiftieth course of stones, to a small antechamber, and through it to the royal chamber. Here, as in a great cavern, the light of your torch has little effect upon the darkness, for the chamber is thirty-four feet long, seventeen feet wide, and nineteen feet high. The walls are of polished granite, and if you would climb above the ceiling, you would find several smaller chambers constructed to resist the pressure of the great weight of the stones above. The roofing slabs, weighing about 54 tons each, are the largest stones in the pyramid. From the ceiling, small holes lead upward for ventilation. It is only with a flashlight that the chamber is sufficiently illuminated that you may appreciate it. Then you admire the polished walls. In a corner, you see a stone sarcophagus which must have been built into the pyramid, for it is too large to have been carried through the passageways. Perhaps in it the king was buried, but we do not know. Its lid is gone, and it is empty. Perhaps some grave robber plundered it and carried the royal mummy away. Perhaps it is true that when King Khufu died, his people refused to bury him in the great tomb which impoverished them to build. Perhaps, as someone has suggested, there is still somewhere another secret chamber which neither the early robber nor the modern explorer has been able to discover, where the mummy of Khufu is still reposing in peace, waiting for the return of his soul.